Hi, I'm Peter Herbeck. We're back again with Father James Mallon, the author of Divine Renovation, Bringing Your Parish from Maintenance to Mission. Really one of the, one of the best, maybe, I think the best book out right now. I have to tell you, it's the best book I've read on the issue of how do we actually move from maintenance to mission? How do we become, like Pope Francis says, communities of missionary disciples? That's right. Okay, we ended last program. You just began to touch on the role of the leader of casting vision yes. and how that happens. So let's, yeah. let's cover that. Well, I think to begin with, we've got to define vision is about where we desire to go. It's, it's about the future that makes us so excited that I can't sleep at night. I think of uh, one of the great vision statements, uh, uh, Martin Luther King on the Washington Mall. He didn't get up and say, I have a plan. He didn't say, I have a strategy. I have an idea. Uh, I, have a, I, have, I have a to-do list. He said, I have a dream. And he painted a dream that, that, that was beautiful and moving and stirring. That's a vision, a picture of the future that makes you passionate, makes you excited. But, and I think this is one of the most crucial things in the, the, in the, in the, for the task of a leader. And we are a hierarchical church, which means, doesn't mean that we are a structured church. It means we are led by priests. The word uh, hieros and arcane means, means led by priests. That's, that's, that's dogmatically defined. That's who we are as a, as a church. And so the role of leadership uh, uh, within the, the task of the priesthood is key. And I'm going to talk about a, a bit more of this. Uh, so you can't be avoided. And it's first of all to, to be in touch with, with a vision and to communicate that vision to others. And by communicating it, I don't just mean, you know, post it in the, in the bulletin. I mean, you got to win people to it. You got you to like make people go, wow. I would love to be a part of that. And so, and so vision, if it's a picture of the future that makes you passionate, it's all about where are we going? Because if you're going to say we're going to be a missionary parish, that means we're going to be a parish that's going somewhere. Okay? So if you're going to say, let's go, well, the question is, well, where are we going? Yeah. Well, that's it. If you're going to go anywhere, if you don't know where you're going, uh, anywhere will get you there, right? So yeah. you've got to know where <laughs> yeah. you're going. And so I think this is really key. And that means that uh, be, even before the pastor sits down with uh, a, a pastoral council or a leadership team to enunciate a, a, a shared vision, uh, the pastor can't be shy about the fact that as leader, he's going to have a, a huge uh, impact in the shaping of that vision. It's no coincidence that parishes, after a number of years, will end up reflecting the passions and personality of the pastor. Yeah. The things the pastor is passionate about will be reflected within the parish because he's because he's a leader. So the first task then under vision is for that for each person listening, whether you're a, a pastor or in ministry or whatever you do, what is the dream for the the future of your ministry that makes you incredibly excited? And I even encourage you to write it down. Now, don't write down a plan. Don't tell me how you're going to get there. Paint the picture. Tell me, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What's happening? So you said 10, the book, put the sign on the now. bus then. You said, put, to... and that, putting the sign on the bus is about communicating. That's about letting others okay. know where the bus is going. I see. Yeah. But before you put the sign on, sign on, you're supposed you, to be on the sign you, itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So now here's the thing. People will say, well, I, maybe one of your gifts is being, a, is being visionary. And that's, that, that is one of the, the gifts that I have. Uh, but here's the thing. I, I think that People have different leadership capacities, but everyone has the capacity to become a better leader. And, and everyone, you know, if you're in the priesthood, uh, if you gave your life, you, you, you had a, a passion, you had a vision that burned in your heart. And everyone has it. Everyone is, has capacity to be a visionary. And here's, I, I believe, one way to find it. it. I'll tell you a story. When I, years ago, when I used to go to conferences, like I had this burning desire in my heart to see renewal within, within parishes. And I go to conferences and I hear these amazing speakers. And I'd have a simultaneous reaction. I'd be like, ah, oh, this is amazing. It's so inspiring. I'd be like absolutely on fire and convicted. And then I think about my parish and I get totally depressed. And it was weird. It's like here I'm, I'm inspired and depressed at the same time. Uh, and, and the temptation I think is, is to is to allow the, the reality in, in the face of, of what we feel called to, to, to get us down, to, to make us just give up and say, why bother, why bother? Uh, but you've got, you've got to be in that zone uh, and you've got to begin from, from where you are. And I think that that f frustration, because if you get inspired and then you look at your reality, what's gonna come from that is a sense of frustration. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. That can be a good thing. No, it can be a bad thing. 
it can lead to negativity and to despair and lack of and cynicism hope. and just cynicism, kind of, yeah. anger, bitterness. Yeah. And I've had to struggle with that in my own life. I've had to, a number of times, I've had to repent and bring that be, before the Lord. But I believe there's a godly discontent that is a good thing. Uh, Jeremiah talks about, you know, the, the fire burning in his bones. He can't keep it in. Um, there is a sense of find the thing that drives you crazy and, and, and don't medicate it. Don't, don't hide it. Uh, let it come to the fore in a, in, a, in a godly way. I think, for instance, of a, of a mosquito bite. You know, if you've ever been bitten by a mosquito, there's this sense of you want to scratch it, but you know if you scratch it, it'll get worse. Right. Well, I say scratch it. Scratch it. Scratch where it itches there. Scratch yeah. the itch yeah. of, 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 of your discontent. And the, I say this because the very thing that drives you crazy is the mirror image of what will be your vision. Hmm. For example, how did, how did that work for you? Like concretely, what did it look like? It, it, it worked for me because uh, I, I desired to see a, a, a parish. What drove me crazy was the, the lack of maturity in, 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 in Catholic believers. Uh, maturity didn't even seem to be an issue. You know, to be a mature believer, that's the priest's job drove me crazy. The fact that so few Catholics are engaged in discipleship, the fact that a lot of Catholics don't seem to know the Lord in a personal way, they don't read the, the scriptures. You know what drove me crazy is, is, is the celebrations of the Eucharist that are dead. There's like a zombie convention. You know, I remember one time this kid saying to me, oh, I don't like Mass, I find it boring. I said, you know something? You're boring. I have to stand up there and look at your face every week. <laughs> You're boring. Like, I, I, that drove me crazy. And so what does that tell me? It tells me that my vision, my passion, is to have a, a son, experience of Sunday Eucharist that is dynamic, it's vibrant, it's alive, a community that is outward focused, not inward focused, that's making disciples, bringing people to Jesus, bringing people to maturity, has communities of authentic love and caring, and they're equipping people for ministry and sending them out. That image of the church, if I dwell on it, I, I lose sleep. I, I can't sleep. I get so excited about it. And so in that case, the, the very thing that drove me crazy is the mirror image of, of the vision. And so I came into my parish with this sense of vision and I, and I asked over and over again, this is where we come to communicating vision. And communicating vision is about winning people. And this is often where, 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 where the thing breaks up because a priest can come into a parish with great vision and, and he jumps from what's in his heart to implementing change. Well, the people don't know what the heck you're doing. It, the priest is like, we're going here. The people are like, what are you talking about? We didn't even know we were supposed to go anywhere. And where is here? Because you haven't told us. And, and communicating vision is the next essential element. It's about winning people. Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, the, the primary way a priest can communicate vision is, is preaching, the Sunday homily. This is very, very key. Uh, at St. Benedict Parish, I preach a visioning homily every three weeks. And at our parish, one person preaches all weekends. We have four weekend masses. I know that's a challenge for some pastors, depends on, based on your structure, but if you're structured in a way uh, that, that you're not able as a pastor, because only the pastor can speak to vision, can, can speak to everyone on week, one weekend, I really, really encourage you to look at your mass schedule. Some parishes have a, a mass schedule that can't be done and, and there's no way it can, be, it can be changed because of the physical layout. Yeah. But 80% of parishes, in my experience, that have a, all these masses, they don't need all these masses. It, it's not, they could very easily change and have a parish where the pastor could, could, could speak to the whole parish. Because that is, if you want to speak to your people and say, guess what, folks, we're, we're going to go and this is where we're going, uh, you've got to speak to people. Because if you just implement change, the thing will fall apart and it will break apart. So you say every three weeks you give, every third week you give a visioning homily. Yes. Give an example. What do you, what do you say? What do you do? It's essentially about the main thing. <laughs> repeating again, the, the, as I said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. It's what is the main thing? It's reminding the, the church about its purpose, uh, about why we're doing the things we're doing, why we're perhaps making this particular change or that particular change. I remember one weekend a couple of years ago, I did a, a visioning homily on, on youth ministry. We went to hire a youth minister. And, and in many ways, the way to do a key visioning homily to motivate people to desire change is, is to, just like I say, scratch the itch. Scratch the itch of the people. Say to people, are you, are you happy that many of your children and grandchildren don't go to church? Is this something you're content with? Yeah. Do you want to do something about do you this? Want to, or, like, yeah. is this, is this but of course people aren't happy about this. Scratch the itch. Help people to get to the point where they're like, yes, we want to go where you're talking about. I did the same when we intro introduced uh, mid-sized groups in our parish. So right now we have about 
15, 18% of our adult population in mid-sized groups. If you live in mid-sized groups of 20 to 30 people that meet every two weeks in homes. How many and, is a mid-sized group? Uh, 20 to 30 people. You said, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. And yeah. so these are, these are communities where people are cared for and loved. Yeah. See, in my parish, we have 16, 1,700 people on a weekend. And I said to people, what is the, what is the meaning of Christian community? I said, the traditional model of pastoral care was called father. Well, guess what? I'm not going to show up at your door uh, unless there's a great tragedy in your life. Uh, is that the level of care that we want to have in our parish? Are you satisfied with that level of care and compassion? Of course people think that's terrible. It says, well, we, we've got to do something about it. We want to be a community where people are known and loved and cared for, and the clergy-centric model can never accomplish that. We need to care for one another. We need to break our large parish into small and to give people a vision and a taste of what it can mean so they're like, yeah, that's when you, good. When you say cler clergy-centric, does that relate to the, the clericalism stuff that you touch on in the book? Is that I, related I to that? I think clericalism is a huge, huge issue in our, in our church that we've got to o o overcome. Uh, Can you define that for us, for our listeners, and then... I define clericalism as the appropriation by the clerical caste and by clerical caste, I include r religious and even lay people because some lay pastoral workers have ad adopted a clerical mindset. Uh, it's the appropriation of the clerical caste of what is proper to the baptized. So basically, uh, being a missionary disciple, uh, you, you can't do that. Uh, I don't expect that of you. Let me do it for you. It's my job. It's yeah. My, yeah, yeah, it's my job. I'm, I'm the professional Christian. You just we sit back and... We can't ask that of you because you no, have all these other responsibilities no, no, no. in your life and it's but asking I'm, too much. I'm but... called father. What is the primary desire yeah. of a father to see his children grow and become mature? And, and, and St. Paul says, for this I labor to present you all complete, mature in Christ. Uh, this, this is one of the primary goals of pastoral care, the care of the shepherd to feed the sheep. Why do you feed sheep? Same reason as you feed your kids. Uh, so that they grow up to be big and strong. We want our people to grow to maturity. That's discipleship. And, and you know, clericalism is basically, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's like the, 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 the lay person says, you do it for me. You be my spiritual surrogate. You be that holy person up in the pedestal because that helps me to convince myself that I could never be that. So you do it for me and I, I'm going to leave you in isolation and God help you if you, if you fall from this pedestal. And it, it's, mut it's mutual. Uh, Pope Francis calls it a mutually sinful condition. And, and, uh, and it feeds, it feeds the, the lack of maturity uh, within, within uh, the la laity. It, and it's not that we're, we're intolerant of, of immaturity. <laughs> Any family who has children, you expect immaturity in children. But any parent knows that the child eventually becomes mature. That's the whole point of parenting. Is, but the church will always have immature members because we're always called to be fecund, to be life-giving, to have babies. If, if, if our parish ever becomes 100% committed believers, guess what? You stopped having spiritual babies about 10 years ago. You're sterile. Yeah. And good for you that you're all, you're all mature. But, so a parish always has to have immature believers but they're in a process of, of maturation. We, what we should not be tolerant of is, you know, if you came home and found your 28-year-old son in his right mind, sitting on the couch in diapers sucking his thumb, you would be a little concerned, I think. Yeah. You know, you would expect that from your two-year-old, but not of your 28-year-old. But yet, in the church, we seem to tolerate this. It's almost like it's cute. You know, parishioners who don't know how to pray, they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They know nothing about the scriptures. Okay, maybe before the invention of the printing press, we had an, we had an excuse. Maybe before universal literacy, we had an excuse. But guess what? It's not the 16th century anymore. It's not the 19th century any, anymore. We, we, we've got to help people to grow. And I think clericalism has a huge role to play in that. So you know, we've got to, in terms of communicating vision, yeah. the homily is key. I can't underestimate that enough, that you've got to take control of your message on a weekend because that's your single biggest tool to say this is where we're going. But then you've got to identify your key stakeholders in a sense, you know, your, your staff, your key volunteers, your ministry leaders. It could be the person who runs a prayer ministry. Heck, it could just be Mrs. Smith who, who just has great influence over others. And you can't just be going to the people who you like and who agree with you. You've got to sit down and not just say, here's where I, I sense God calling us to go. It's to, to, to paint the dream with that person and say to that person, you know, I know that you might not agree with everything I stand, I stand for, but I know that you're an influential person. You're a key person in this community. Would you help? Would you help come alongside and help us make this happen so we can own it together? And, and you've got to win your key people because if you don't win your key people, when you begin to implement the change, that's where division 
because a vision is where you're going. If you have two visions, you have division. And that's the importance of vision and communicating vision. That's a great lead-in, Father, for our next show on leadership, forming a leadership team, friends. Session three is all about that. That's a key building block for being able to become a missionary parish.